So I like to think of awkwardness as an ability and shyness and introversion as more of like a preference. Welcome to Success Insider, a podcast for emerging leaders and anyone seeking motivation, inspiration, and business or career advancement. Brought to you by Success Magazine. Listen, learn, grow. Join us this week as Josh and Shelby find out why being awkward isn't as bad as we think it is in a discussion with Tai Tashiro, author of Awkward, the science of why we're socially awkward and why that's awesome. Shelby and Josh get personal and share what makes them awkward, and they share 10 things to remember to be less awkward and nail your next introduction. And now our hosts, Shelby Skirhawk and Josh Ellis. I can't quite hear you, Josh. Well, that I, I tried to do the scale up thing, like uh, you know, the roller coaster. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, Shelby. How, how's that? How was that one? Better, I guess. <laughs> uh, so, Shelby, do you know what today's episode is? I, why are you being so weird? <laughs> uh, it, it's nothing. No big deal. <laughs> What are you? What are you talking about? Again, this is so disjointed. Like, why? What? What's happening here? I mean, just be easy, Shelby. I'm, I guess I'm just feeling a little. Okay. I, so you're feeling awkward today, is what you're saying? Well, aren't I? Aren't I being awkward? <laughs> yes. Everyone listening to this is going, "Oh, this is awful." And awkward. Pulling teeth. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, yep. I, I can see what you're doing, though. You're being awkward on purpose. Yes, on purpose. <laughs> right, as, as opposed, opposed to your to normal. As opposed to my usual awkward. Uh, but awkwardness is a worthy topic. I'm, I mean, think a lot of people, especially introverts, people who don't normally put themselves out there, I mean, they often feel awkward, and so they pull back from networking and relationships and all of those situations. Yeah, and let me just smack myself here. Ow. So I go from Urkel to Stefan, right? <laughs> yes. I, I, I go from uh, awkward to uh, my usual... Debonair. Uh, debonair, dashing self. Yeah, um, awkwardness. It comes in many forms. It's saying the wrong thing or... Not knowing what to say or having a uh, unique body language, maybe, or a unique laugh or not making eye contact. But you know what, Shelby? Being awkward is not all bad. Like our dear friend upstairs, uh, Kelly. She confesses to being awkward, right? She'll tell you, I'm awkward. And I think that that is entirely her charm. And see, I really don't think she's awkward at all. I mean, if anything... Sorry, Josh, but you're awkward when you talk to Kelly. What? <laughs> yes. I Yeah. I, I hear those conversations and yeah. Um, well, anyway, I'm surprised <laughs> that you say that. <laughs> I didn't know I was so awkward. Um, well, I've always thought she was though. So now you, now you're making me feel so awkward. <laughs> um, but I've always thought that her mannerisms and her voice are really unique, right? In a way that's kind of endearing. I I don't see You don't it, see it? But for it's just I'm I'm argument awkward. sake. I'm weird. <laughs> Fair enough. All right. Well, therein lies the point then. Um we are all unique. And whether we know it or not, we are all awkward. We are snowflakes, Shelby, <laughs> as they say. And even the most uh, seemingly debonair people are awkward in their own way sometimes, and that's just called being a character. You know, you are definitely a character, Josh. All right, I know that you are also just using that as another excuse to call me awkward, (laughs) but should be, I will take it. Well, with good reason. Up next, we're going to talk to a guy who literally wrote the book on awkwardness. Ty Tashiro is a self-proclaimed data nerd. He's a psychologist and interpersonal relationships expert who studied decades of research into human intelligence, neuroscience, personality, and sociology to help us better understand the widely shared trait of, yep, awkwardness. His book is titled Awkward, The Science of Why We're Socially Awkward and Why That's Awesome. 
Ty, welcome to Success Insider. Hey, thanks for having me on. Well, I have to say, first off, that we love the book here at Success. We received a copy a couple months back, and there's there's like this little train going on where someone reads it and then leaves it on the desk of a coworker who they think is awkward. And it's really showing no signs of slowing down. So uh, good work. Oh, well, that's great. Yeah, well, that's very positive feedback. Yeah, I guess the moral of the story is really that we are all awkward in a way, wouldn't you say? I, I think that's true. And there's actually some good data to show that that's the case. So um, awkward characteristics, so things like social skill deficits or communication problems, these are actually on a bell curve in the general population. So that means the average person in the population actually has a few awkward things about them. Well, so let's go ahead and talk about that definition. As, as you've defined it, what is awkwardness and, and why is it something that we really should be cognizant of? Yeah, well, I think there's uh, two different kinds of awkwardness. There's awkward moments and then there's awkward people. And awkward moments are just those times when we deviate from minor social expectations. So having our zipper zipped or not having spinach in our front teeth, uh, when we violate these expectations, we feel really embarrassed and awkward. And it's a really strong emotional reaction given how small these deviations are. There's also awkward people. And awkward people obviously have more awkward moments than the average person. But from psychological studies, we also know that they see the world differently than most people. And they tend to see the world in this really focused, sharply focused way. And they tend to fixate on things that are a little bit unique or different than what the average person uh, tends to put their attention on. So that's why they tend to miss social cues or social expectations that other people easily see. Is it, um, if we think of like the classic case, am, am I thinking of like Rain Man? Is, is, is that... That I understand that he was um, was autistic. Is that what it was? The Michael Douglas movie. That's right. Yeah, yep. yeah. That was actually a big um, cultural thing. So that's far away on one scale, right? Exactly. Yeah. So that would be someone diagnosable with uh, an autism spectrum disorder. And there's actually been a lot of research looking at the differences between awkwardness and someone who has a diagnosable condition. So something like autism or Asperger's. And there's a a pretty good dividing line between the two. So if someone's social skill deficits and communication problems are really severe to the point that it makes it hard for them to navigate daily life, then you probably have somebody who has a diagnosis. Um, awkward people share some of the same characteristics as people with autism or Asperger's, but the severity is far from what it would be if someone had a diagnosis. Sure. And I don't have Tourette's, Shelby. I just cuss a lot. Um, okay, so then you you mentioned a bell curve, and uh, maybe more than we know people who are, you, you would say, awkward, it seems like everyone can think of people who are really suave, right? And, and, and mm. I do think people are unique, but we all know that person that I'm talking about that just seems like they're always on, mm -hmm. and maybe it's, uh, I don't know, a classic case, a case is uh, media people like... Um, I don't know, Ryan Seacrest or like a Megyn Kelly, or they just seem to be so polished all the time. And maybe that's why they're on TV because they are that suave. Yeah. Yeah. So they would be at the tail end of that bell curve of awkwardness, right? They'd have really low um, prevalence of those characteristics. And I'm sure they have their moments every now and then, but they're probably fewer than someone like me would have, <laughs> for example, and uh, fewer than the average person would have. But some people, yeah, are just really what I would call socially fluent. And that just means that they, boy, pick up on social cues that other people might miss. They process that information really quickly and really well. And they always seem to know what to come back with, how to respond to a situation. I think that's really probably what sets them apart. Well, so you've you've spoken about feeling awkward yourself in, in some ways, but what in particular drew you to this topic? Yeah, well, I was, you know, I was a really awkward kid, actually, and most awkward people will tell you that they can remember being awkward for as long as they can remember. Um, I was really lucky to have uh, just exceptional parents who uh, recognized that I had some awkwardness and parented me in a way that really helped me out and I've been lucky in my life that I've had great friends and great family and 
really been happy with my social relationships. Uh, but a few years ago, I was noticing that I had a handful of friends who were in new situations. So they had moved to new cities or, or new jobs, and a lot of them were struggling. And when I got to see it in person, I was finding that new people just wouldn't give them a chance because they were clumsy with these early social interactions, these social graces, and people would assume that it wasn't someone they wanted to get to know better. And I thought that was really too bad because these were great people who had great hearts and great intention. Uh, really, the worst thing that they would do is just be a little awkward at the start of social interactions. And I thought, boy, if they could just skip the first five minutes <laughs> of a social interaction, they'd probably be a lot better off. And, and that kind of got me into looking into uh, one, if there was a book about it, and uh, two, what the research was. And I found great research and uh, not anybody who had really written a book about it yet. So a lot of the book, and again, it's uh, it's called Awkward, The Science of Why We're Socially Awkward and Why That's Awesome. Uh, a lot of the book is devoted to people who are, some might just say, shy. They don't always like to make eye contact. They're more quiet than others, maybe a little standoffish, or uh, they say odd things. Is that kind of a classic case? And, and what are some other things that might encompass awkwardness? Yeah, there's a, there's a number of characteristics that overlap with awkwardness. So shyness would be a good example of that. Um, awkward people do tend to be on the shy side. Yeah, there are some extroverted awkward people. <laughs> Those are the folks who probably talk too much sometimes or uh, go on for too long. But yeah, awkward people tend to be shy. And so that can mean that they don't want to be around social interactions as much. Maybe they don't want to be in big social groups. Um, but some of the characteristics of awkward people are distinct from shyness. So things like erratic eye contact or um, not being very certain about how to handle a social situation, those things would be uniquely awkward, actually. So I like to think of awkwardness as an ability, and shyness and introversion as more of like a preference. So you prefer more alone time or you prefer more one-on-one -on -one kinds of things. Well, so it occurs to me then, Ty, that there is a self-perception of awkwardness that, that you can you can feel it. You feel like you just you said the wrong thing or you came across really, really oddly. But that's not always necessarily the actual perception, right? I mean, we may think we're a whole lot more awkward than we really are. Yeah, that, that could definitely happen. And if, you know, if someone's, let's say, really anxious or might have some low self-esteem mixed in there, then that can certainly be the case that they think they're more awkward than they really are. Um, on the flip side, if someone's overly confident, <laughs> they might think they're much more charming uh, than they really are or not as awkward as they are. So there's other personality characteristics that can influence how the awkwardness manifests and influence how people perceive themselves. But I think on average, the average awkward person kind of has a sense that they're awkward. And they don't always recognize that they're being awkward in the moment right away. Uh, but, they, but they do know that they're not, not quite getting it right a lot of the time. So unlike a lot of, I, I guess, uh, or I suppose guests that we have on Success Insider, you're not trying to fix anyone who's awkward. Uh, nothing like that, in fact. And so I want to I just get out of your way and let you make the case why uh, being socially awkward, as you say in the title of the book, is awesome. Yeah, there is a there are some great upsides actually to being awkward, which I I was pleasantly surprised to find. And uh, there's some really good research showing that awkward people are particularly enthusiastic and really passionate about the things that they love. I think in pop culture we talk about people nerding out over things, and awkward people are certainly prone to doing that. But that's really a wonderful thing if you think about it that they just really get immersed and absorb themselves in the things that are interesting to them. So I think that's a, a certainly a, a great upside. Another thing that you find related to that is that awkwardness shows an association with what psychologists call striking talent. And striking talent means that you're really um, excellent in a particular area. So it's not across the board necessarily, but you might be you know, an excellent uh, dancer or mathematician uh, whatever it might be, you really excel in that area. And that enthusiasm and that passion that awkward people have contributes to that, as well as their sharp focus. And some of the current thinking is that the sharp focus and the enthusiasm 
combine to drive awkward people to deliberate practice, which is oftentimes talked about as the 10,000 hours of practice you need to do to get expert or be masterful at something. Well, awkward people have a disposition that actually makes it a little bit easier for them to engage in that kind of deliberate practice. That's a combination there, that uh, mathematician and dancer. <laughs> yeah, I did have one friend one time actually in college, and she was a double major in those two things, <laughs> <laughs> oddly enough. And she was an outlier, certainly, but uh, she was the best in, best in both. But uh, yeah, usually you find it that it's with striking talent, it's within a specific area. And creative and more systematic things like math and science tend not to overlap with each other. So let's talk about some more strengths of awkward people. Like, how can they recognize and capitalize on these strengths? You know, I think, I think part of it's just being comfortable with the things that they enjoy. They don't like some of the same things that other people like. And I think you see that in grade school and uh, junior high and high school. They just, they have some kind of quirky interests. And so getting some comfort with that and being okay with that, I think that's a really good step. Uh, the internet has been good in some ways for awkward people in the sense that it's helped people with unusual or quirky interests find each other. And that's been great through social media or chat rooms or whatever else, and even in-person meetups where folks can find people with similar interests. So I think that's one really good thing um, that they can do. I think another thing is just to really recognize that that focus they have and that stubbornness and that persistence, um, that's something that can be applied to just about any domain to help you get better at something and, and help you progress through the really the hard work that needs to happen to become excellent at something. It's like so many of the times when I meet someone and, uh, you know, I say the wrong thing or whatever, and I, I feel awkward about it. It's like, I shouldn't worry. I shouldn't be so guarded about it. It's really just let your freak flag fly. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd, I'd agree with you. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's not life or death. Uh, but we feel that way sometimes, right? So when we do something awkward, we think, oh, gosh, that was so embarrassing, or how could I have done that? But it's oftentimes the case when we step away from it, and a little bit of time passes, we can find that funny or, or humorous. And I think that's a really great thing, actually, about awkward moments, um, especially in adulthood. It's, it's a little tough sometimes when someone's in junior high and things are a little <laughs> a little more tense, oh, I think, when you have a social misstep in that kind of context. But uh but yeah, in adulthood, I mean, I, th I think we do find a lot of times people are much more um, open and forgiving than, than we think they are. Shelby, you really cannot imagine what it's like to be an eighth grade boy, <laughs> you know? There is no, there's <laughs> nothing that compares to it and just how awkward you are. Nope, I can't say it. <laughs> All right, Ty. Well, we enjoyed it. Uh, let us uh, awkwardly dismount here and, and just say thanks. Thanks for having me on. Okay, Sherble. It's just you and me here. No one is going to hear this. Just you and me. Oh, okay. And maybe Mariana. You can trust and confide in me totally. What makes you awkward, Shelby? What's uh, something awkward that you do? I, I can't talk to big groups casually. I can speak to a group... Uh, make an announcement or something something business or work related but if i were to have some type of exclamation about hey look at this cool thing i found or or something funny that happened i, I i'm not one of those people that just pipes up and like everyone starts listening like if anything i'll just like be like hey hey jess <laughs> and like i'll pull one person over and hope that everyone else hears it so what would happen if you did? Like you start sweating, your tongue falls out? What, what would I, I happen? Literally, I've tried where there's been times where I like probably needed to say something and it would have been the, for the benefit of the entire group kind of listening. But I, I yeah, I can't do it. Like I, I just, I'll just slide over to someone and start talking to them individually and, and spread the word that way. Well, I don't know. I mean, you say that you're so bad at this, but I'm thinking of times when you do it. We had our stand up this morning. But that's the, what I'm the, saying. That's about work. Group like discussion. I can, I can, I can do that. But if I were to, if I was looking at my phone, I was flipping through and I saw something funny on Twitter. I don't feel like I could command people's attention to be like, "Hey, check this out." Like I, I don't know. I, I, I don't. Maybe it's because I'm trying to be funny mm -hmm. in public in a big group, and I can't do that. My, uh, my girlfriend. 
works with a woman, like 60 years old, very adult woman, very smart. But anytime they're in a meeting and she has to, she has something to say, if someone else is talking, then instead of waiting for the moment when there's a pause and she can interject, she will hold up her hand oh like she's gosh. in third grade and she wow. will keep her hand up for three minutes, five minutes, as long as it takes and so, until she gets to talk. And so when you're talking, would you be the person that is able to keep talking and be like, nope, I'm going to keep talking? How or, do you keep talking when or, someone's yeah, doing that? you're just that? like, oh, oh, okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, I have a totally different problem and I think I'm better at it than I used to be. Um, but I, I used to be really bad about interrupting people. And I think that's a lot worse than being afraid to speak up at all. Yeah, I can see that. But I don't think you have that problem now. You have good. You have grown and improved. Good. Thank goodness. How else are we going to do this podcast? Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, I've got uh, I've got some foibles of my own. Uh, in addition to the way I speak to Kelly upstairs, <laughs> as you uh, it, claim, it's uh, I couldn't explain it. It's that I think that she's so weird that I'm trying to get weird on her level to to communicate with. And her. I it's think, like you know how if you're if you don't have a country accent but you go out to some rural area right. and you come pull up to the general store and you're like, I'll have a full tank of gas <laughs> just to, you know, get on their level. And see, I think that she, you've heard her say when you've been talking to her and, and you'll say something like, you know, uh, we were talking about Paige's baby or something and uh -huh. like she just gave birth and, and I could see where you're going with the joke. Like, oh, you know, kept that kid alive or something like that. And she was like, no, why would you say that? God, you're weird. <laughs> like, I mean, she will... Yeah, so I I would say she's probably okay. She makes you feel a little awkward. Uh, I'm telling you, I'm doing it for her benefit. Okay, I don't want her to feel awkward. Oh, so I'm, okay. I'm doing it. To, All right. Okay. Anyway, it's really nice of you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but that's not the only thing that's awkward. That and arguing about whether or not I'm awkward. <laughs> um, I'll tell you what I do that annoys me the most and makes me feel the most awkward, whether people know it or not, is I forget people's names yeah. people who i i know their names but it, it's like a fight or flight thing that when i see him like uh jerry reagan upstairs nice guy works right next to me right see him every day but and i know his name his name is jerry reagan <laughs> it says it on his desk i see him at the coffee thing and i'll be like hey bub <laughs> I, I cannot think of his name in person uh I've yeah. done it. I've done it with Garrett. I called Garrett Blake one time. I'd known <laughs> Garrett for a year. Right, right. I, I, I just do it all the time with, you know, with people that I don't, you know, necessarily deal with or talk to very much, but I know them. Right. I still freak out. Yeah, it's. I can see that, but I think there's plenty of ways that we can all be awkward. Here's here's a topic that I wanted to make sure we got to. The fine line of eye contact, right? Mm -hmm. If you are constantly making eye contact, do you feel like that's weird? If somebody like right. will not let staring up and they're you, just yeah. staring a hole through you? Yeah. Um, on the other hand, I catch myself sometimes feeling like I'm not making enough eye contact. And um, that's weird too. So how do you how do you strike that balance? Well, as soon as you ta start talking about it, it feels awkward. I mean, we're we're yeah. having this conversation, yeah. and we've we're making little... eye contact right now. Yeah, both we've... of us are. It's like a game of chicken. Who's gonna let, who's gonna... <laughs> okay, I, I I gave in. I, All right, yeah. good. I win. There's <laughs> well, also there's also the handshake. I think yeah. handshakes are terribly awkward. Right? I don't think so. Um, you know, people don't necessarily always have the same handshake so i go for a good firm handshake mm -hmm. and you know i only get only get three fingers or something like i miss it right uh, or or the other person <laughs> shakes even harder and i'm like shaking back harder like no i'm not gonna <laughs> let you win this handshake or or if somebody wants to like fist bump you know and i give a handshake so it, it's just weird it's just weird it's awkward but um <laughs> Here we are laughing about it, right? Let me ask you, have you ever had the situation where you've been out reaching your hand for a handshake and they went in for a hug and you may have oh, yeah. touched them awkwardly? And the other way around. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Josh. Uh, pretty excited here. Yeah? Yep. I got two new freelance gigs starting soon and that's happened ever since I signed up for FreshBooks. It's really made things a lot easier. Money. <laughs> See? 
I told you it was a great cloud accounting software for getting you organized and making your work life much simpler. Yep, you were right. I should have known by now to listen to you about this stuff. Mm -hmm. You're very, very wise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Seriously, though, I mean, it's been very helpful setting up new clients in FreshBooks. It really just took a few clicks. And what's great is that I can track my time, which is very important. So I can know what jobs I've worked on and, and, and I can see all of it right there in FreshBooks. So when I'm ready to invoice, it auto populates all of my hours and into the invoice and, and it looks all professional and, and then I'm ready to go and get money. With FreshBooks, bam, it's right there for you, like you said. And of course, sending the invoice is just as simple since you can do it from FreshBooks. Yeah, I think everybody in the you economy, like we talk about here on the podcast, really does need something like FreshBooks. I mean, I don't see why you wouldn't use it. And they are in luck because FreshBooks is offering a 30-day unrestricted free trial to all Success Insider listeners. Claiming the trial is just as simple as using FreshBooks. Just go to freshbooks.com slash insider and enter Success Insider in the How Did You Hear About Us section. Go sign up now. So what is one of the most awkward things that we all have to do, Shelby? And we all have to do it. That would be small talk. Small talk and chit chat to get a segment started on a podcast. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it could be entirely possible. Small talk, yes, but small talk, especially when you are meeting someone new, being introduced, say, exactly. and, and like in your career or, you know, just your personal life, you're, we're constantly bumping into new people. And, and in business, especially, it's crucial to make a, a, a positive first impression, right? Right. And this is this is more than just the, hey, this is so-and-so, hey, you know, nice to meet you. We're talking about these kind of crucial introductions that happen. You know, maybe it is at a networking event and you've got, um, you've got a friend there that can introduce you to somebody that you've been wanting to meet. Mm -hmm. Or it is in social situations, kind of this classic um, etiquette that, you know, when you introduce someone, you say, you know, hi, this is so-and-so, you know, and give a little bit of uh, background as to the person, like what they do. Right. All of these are these introduction scenarios that get a little awkward. Yeah. I mean, are you supposed to bow and kiss her hand or so. curtsy or who even knows anymore what the modern uh, etiquette says? I know you're supposed to introduce the person with the the higher, like the higher title. So it, you would say, Mr. Big Shot, meet my friend so-and-so instead of going, hey, friend, here's Mr. Big Shot. Do you know what I mean? Well, anyone who's going to get upset about going first in that scenario I don't want to be introduced to anyway <laughs> I think I think right. I like my my uh, my associates a little bit more casual than that but especially if he calls himself mr. Big shot let me tell you though about um, we recently met someone who was on our cover and you may remember this meeting backstage at a certain event because yes. it was I had spoken to him before and I don't want to give away who it was because it's not not really germane to the conversation, but we were introduced to him. Yes. And we all said hello, and we had uh, a moment to size up the situation and uh, be introduced. And then I just kind of I didn't really have anything else to say. <laughs> right. I, and luckily, we had Paige there, Paige, who usually um, introduces this here podcast, uh, who's out on maternity leave right now. And she was a dynamo. She She could just come up with crap to talk about i know like it was nobody's business fantastic and me i'm just like well all right like your shoes <laughs> <laughs> like i had nothing but luckily success.com as is so often the case has a little primer on how to perfect the introduction make it not as awkward as it can be this is from an article by patty johnson from uh, usual uh, regular of, of yours on the site, right? And it's yep. called Nice to Meet You, The Art of Being Introduced. She's got some good tips here. All right. So 10 things to remember. Number one, the introducer is using their reputation for you. So when someone introduces you, they're asking a friend or colleague to make time for you. It's, it's really a personal favor. So keep that in mind. Number two, follow up quickly. When somebody makes an introduction for you, uh, in business, two weeks is an eternity. So within a matter of days, the next week, uh, it's good to uh, to get in touch with that person, especially if you, uh, you've you exchanged business cards or email addresses or 
uh, I don't know, you friended them on Facebook, whatever, whatever it is, just just follow up. Right. Number three, aim for an in-person intro. So Patty has this advice that, you know, not even a great email back and forth is as good or valuable as a face-to-face conversation. So if you're trying to to meet someone, try to push for that in person. Makes a difference. Number four, remember that your schedule is secondary here. If you're going to be asking someone for a favor, you need to adapt to their schedule, not yours. Never ask them to come to you because you are the one asking for the favor. Number five, prepare. This is a a no-brainer, but know who you're going to meet in advance. I mean, research them. It's going to make you not only look better prepared, but it's going to give you a little bit more to say instead of that awkward conversation we had. Number six, know the ask. You have to know what you're really going to be asking this, this person. Figure out what it is you want and then narrow your request as much as you can so that they can help you. Along with that ask, number seven, to work on a relationship, not a transaction. So this isn't all about getting that ask. You know, this is about creating a relationship that will continue. So it's not about asking, do they have a job opening and moving on from there? It's realizing that they may not have a job opening now, but they may have a perfect introduction for you to someone else and or may even create a new position based on your introduction. Numero ocho, show gratitude. It's always nice, even in this modern day and age, to send a personal thank you right after your meeting to both the contact who you were introduced to and your introducer, the facilitator, the friend of yours who helped you out. And a simple thank you note is all it takes to show your appreciation and strengthen the connection. Nine, stay in touch. Now, again, this is uh, a little bit of following up right afterwards, but particularly when you're talking about LinkedIn requests, don't just leave that automated note of I'd like to add you to my professional network, make something personal, make a reference. So one, it it reminds them of who you are, but also it it just creates a better, more connected meaning. And finally, number 10, know that you can't just be a taker. We all know those people in our network who only call when they're looking for a new job, then they hide away until the next time they need help. So do, do a favor for your new contact and your friend and and just ask what can i do keep it going like like shelby said earlier you're working on a relationship not a transaction good stuff all right well that does it for this episode of success insider but first let's dig into that you at success.com mailbag josh i've got one from jerry l haynes who must have heard our episode where we discussed the Dave Ramsey cover story from the June issue of Success. Jerry says, as a licensed financial planner, I do take exception to some of Dave's teachings. As with all of life, if we do not practice discipline, we can get ourselves in trouble. My wife and I have numerous credit cards. One has bonus points for gas. Uh, We travel, so we have one that pays high bonus points for travel and doesn't charge transaction fees when we're out of the country. We have great credit scores because in 20 years, we've never carried a balance. And each year we pay for a nice cruise using our bonus points. He says, Jerry says, I give a financial seminar to young married couples in which I warn against the dangers of credit card debt. My advice is that when they use the credit card, enter the purchase in their checkbook as if the purchase came from the checking account. If there's no money in the checking account and you simply don't use the credit card. Thanks, Jerry, for writing in. You know, I don't think that what you're preaching and what you're, what you're teaching to these young married couples is completely opposite to, to what Dave Ramsey says. No, not all that dissimilar. I agree with you, Shelby. Dave has a particular distaste for credit cards because so many people abuse them. If everyone had your discipline, Jerry, and I do too, by the way, that's exactly my system, what you use, um, then people wouldn't amass huge amounts of debt. But, but again, there are people that abuse them. There, uh, there are people that can have a, uh, a nice glass of wine at night. And then there are people who are total drunks. So I think that you're not wanting to throw the baby out with the bathwater. And Dave is overly conservative. Um, but his theories are all about simplicity. And I think that we can all agree, and you agree, Jerry, that simplicity is better. Well, thanks, Jerry. And remember that you can email us and get your email read on the podcast. Tell us what you thought of an episode. Take our cover figure to task. Anything you want, just send it to you at success.com. 
Until next time, I'm Josh. And I'm Shelby. And we wish you a very awkward today. See ya. So awkward. Awkward.